Today, we are examining the greatest starships throughout Star Wars Legends history, starting with the Age of the Rakata and moving until the Legacy Era. And this represents over 30,000 years of technological innovation. So a few rules here, we're focusing on ship classes rather than singular ships, and I'm really only doing that to avoid the middle part being filled with Sith super weapons, and I really just don't want to look at a dozen different Star Destroyers with super lasers on them. I'm also not going to include any extra galactic, interdimensional, strange, or robotic fleets. What we're really looking at is what ship dominated throughout history. So a few things you guys might notice. The Republic, or rather the dominant galactic government of the day, which was usually the Republic, leads the innovation and possesses the most powerful ship throughout most of history, with of course some exceptions. And this does make sense as the Republic was the one fighting most of the wars, but just keep in mind this isn't a history of Republic starship design. You also might notice a bit of incongruity in regards to ship design, design principles, etc, etc. That's just because of the sort of muddled nature of the pre-OT eras. But let's get started, and we have a lot of ground to cover, 30,000 years. So we're just going to touch on each ship, give a very brief description, then move on. And starting off the list is the ships of the Rakatan Infinite Empire. Unfortunately, we don't know many details of the Rakata other than their general ship design, but it stands that the Infinite Empire, which had a stranglehold on the galaxy, would have had the most powerful ships available until their fall. The Empire was actually established perhaps 40,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, or even earlier, and existed up until 25,000 years BBY. It's very possible that the ships that came later couldn't actually match her cotton ship strength, especially because we know their technology was imbued with the Force. However, we will ignore that just to keep things interesting. And coming next is Zim the Despot. Zim established a vast pre-Republic Empire soon after the fall of the Infinite Empire, and in both Legends and Canon was known for creating massive, for the time at least, vessels. Zim's personal flagships were the Ibon Scimitar and the Death Knell, presumably the largest ship types within his navy. According to the Essential Guide to Warfare, the vessels would have been 500 to 1000 meters. Following Zim is a lost era of naval history, which we will see a few times during this video. However, we do know that the Republic saw a continued rise to prominence. During this era, the numerous Al Sakan conflicts drove the militarization of Coruscant and Al Sakan. We don't know really anything about the ships they used, but it's fair to assume that one of these two states had the most powerful ship in this time. And interestingly, we do see large what I assume to be Al Sakan cruisers in this picture. The Al Sakan conflicts raged for tens of thousands of years, but from a ship design standpoint, the more interesting thing to talk about is the Kumari Empire, which in 10,000 BBY introduced their new Kumari line of battleships, which uniquely used mass drivers and asteroids to bombard planets and enemy vessels, while also achieving space superiority through sheer size and smart design. The ultimate ship in this line was the Cal class battlecruiser, a 3,000 meter long warship. One of these ships was still operating up until and perhaps beyond the Galactic Civil War, though of course was not being used in any sort of fighting capacity. Following that is another dark period, where we know generally what happened in the galaxy but don't know what specific ships were used. However, we do know that the Wayman Sea Storm and the continued Al Sakan conflicts continued to drive ship innovation, particularly in the areas of hull design, energy shielding, and turbo laser power generation. The Sith stood as the main enemies to the Republic, but they preferred smaller ship types like the Darafin Cruiser rather than large, powerful capital ships. The Republic used Kumari cruisers and various ships of their own designation, which have never been formally named. Speaking of, the Sith also used a Dreadnought, but again of unknown style and specification. By the Mandalorian Wars, the Republic had began not only using the famed Hammerhead cruisers, but the inexpungible command ship, a lovely vessel which uniquely mixed carrying, firepower, and command features in a 3 km long frame. The inexpungible was known for its use of the Vangervalis chain, which allowed it to coordinate dozens of smaller cruisers. The vessel also sported 12 squadrons of fighters and 10 turbolaser batteries. Impressive for its era. However, the inexpungible was only made in small numbers and was later replaced by the Centurion, which widely entered both Sith and Republic service. 
The Centurion was significantly smaller, but only had slightly less fighters and firepower. However, while I think it's fair to say that the Centurion was more efficient than its predecessor, it's hard to say that it was more powerful, and I think the Inexpungible still reigned as the most powerful ship in the galaxy at this point. By 3000 BBY, the Republic had introduced the Invincible class. On its face, I wouldn't assume it more powerful than the Inexpungible and Centurion, but with 700 plus years of technological innovation, I will give it the benefit of the doubt. As a note, between these two eras, the Republic also used Super Dread knots, including the Star of Coruscant. Presumably, these were very powerful ships, but we know almost nothing about them. For the next two millennia, the Republic relied largely on pre-existing ship designs or smaller new vessels, focusing on flexibility rather than firepower, as apparently did their enemies. This was until and after the Rusan Reformation, which not only limited the capabilities of a ship, but also demilitarized the Republic, and capital ship production largely fell to the private sector. Some 200 years before the Clone Wars, Kuat Drive Yards introduced the Procurator, which, at 2.5 kilometers long, was likely the largest vessel created in a millennia. The Procurator was later surpassed by the Praetor Mark I, which itself was later passed by the first proper dreadnought in Star Wars Legends history, the Mandator I. These ships notably were not used by the Republic, but rather sat around Kuat, both as a means of planetary defense and as a way to show off the company's technological ability. Due to the Ruzon Reformation, the 8 km long Mandator 1 was underarmed for its size, but was retrofitted during the Clone Wars. The Clone Wars also saw the introduction of the Mandator 2, which was fully armed and also had improved technological capabilities. The Clone Wars also saw the introduction of the Subjugator class of heavy cruisers, including the Malevolence, which were armed with a unique ion superweapon. Whether these ships could actually take on a Mandator, I think is up for discussion, but they were certainly in the running for most powerful ships of the era. Of course, the formation of the Empire saw an increased use of Dreadnoughts, and the 19 km long Executor class was perhaps an order of magnitude more powerful than the 8 km long Mandator 2. Depending on the sources you read, the Executor was perhaps surpassed by the Asserter, but regardless, both were blown out of the water by the introduction of the Eclipse class Super Star Destroyer during Operation Shadow Hand. The Eclipse line and the Incomplete Sovereign line were meant to represent the new generation of warships. They were not only more massive than the Executor, albeit a little bit shorter, but spouted spinally mounted super lasers. In terms of pure firepower and in a one-on-one -on -one battle, arguably the Eclipse was by far the most destructive ship in Star Wars history. That being said, the New Republic's Viscount class Star Defender, and perhaps other Star Defenders of Unknown class, introduced about 25 years after the Battle of Yavin, were arguably better ships, but I'll leave that up to you to decide. The Legacy Era saw the galaxy once again turn away from larger vessels and towards small, nimble fleets. So although technology did advance, it's unlikely that any ship during this era could stand up to a Viscount, Executor, or Eclipse. The most powerful ship, however, was likely the Imperious class Star Destroyer, which certainly had a dreadnought's worth of power generation packed in a smaller hull. But this has just been my telling of history. Did I miss something? Do you want to see me cover canon next? What do you think of my descriptions? Let me know all of that and more down in the comments. Today's question comes from longtime subscriber Nero Studios, who asks whether I think Captain Pelion will be featured in the new Thrawn novel. For those of you who missed it, I did a news video about the newly announced Thrawn Treason, and I think it's likely that Pelion is introduced since he's been formally included in Rebels, and we know that Treason most likely takes place in the months or weeks between Thrawn's sojourn with Ezra. But that's just my opinion. I'd love to hear what you guys think on that question as well. If you have a question you'd like me to answer, make sure to ask it in the comments with the hashtag AskEck. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Until next time, may the Force be with you.